David Littleproud, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, can you just clear this one up for us? Is this a great policy, as Anne Rustin was saying there, or do you think taxpayers should instead be footing the bill, as, as Peter Dutton seems to be suggesting? Yeah, we all want cheaper medicines, but we've got to appreciate this is a fundamental change to the way that medicines are paid for. You've got to appreciate, in this country, the type of medicines and the price of those medicines is regulated. And so to make sure that there was a business model that, that mum and dad chemists and pharmacists around the country undertook, so they were paid an $8 dispensing fee. And so if you change that business model by going from 30 to 60 a days, then that has a fundamental change on those small businesses, and particularly for those young ones that have just got into this, uh, they now have a lot of debt with their house, uh, houses and employees that they have to pay for, and those at retirement have just seen their asset, their superannuation, which is their business, dwindle away without proper consultation. And so what we're saying is this is an opportunity to sit down and get this right because of the unintended consequences, particularly for us in regional Australia. You've got to understand there's over 400 pharmacies that is the last line of primary care for rural and remote Australians. If they leave, uh, then we have nothing. And let me tell you that if they stay, they're not probably going to be able to sell it to anybody because no one's going to want to go out there and start up a pharmacy. So this is the challenge where we just think the government uh, should stop, should pause and should talk to the pharmacy. There are ways through this uh, and the Pharmacy uh, Guild has been trying to engage with the government to get a common sense solution around a phase in about shared risk, shared responsibility on this. But the unintended consequence, unfortunately, is us in rural and regional Australia. Uh, it's our well-being. This isn't about politics. This is actually about our well-being. We've already seen our doctors being ripped out of us because of the change of foreign doctors being allowed to, to work outside rural and remote areas. And now if we lose this, we lose our last line of primary care. There will be. There will be perverse health outcomes. And I fear uh, regional and rural Australians' lives will be put at risk. Well, uh, I'll, I'll come to that risk that you talk about there, but you also referred to shared responsibility in that answer. Can I just be, be clear on this? Are you saying taxpayers should be compensating pharmacists, paying, uh, paying some of the tab here? Well, we already are, David, and when we uh, looked to actually uh, make sure that we took cost of living pressure off childcare, we didn't ask for childcare providers to pay for that in terms of the subsidies that were provided. But I think what uh, the Guild and pharmacists in general have been asking for is common sense solution of sharing that risk about how we get to a model uh, whereby it, there is actually levers, policy levers, a like scope of practice that allows pharmacists to do more and, and what they're actually trying to do at university See, that just makes sense. And that actually requires some support from the states. And, and credit where credit's due, I think Mark Butler has grabbed that baton, but we need to continue to accelerate that because that then opens up the business model for pharmacists to be able to continue uh, to, to have other income streams. Otherwise, they go into things like Webster packs right. that have a perverse outcome for, for aged care and Indigenous Australians. So this is where the government, we're saying to them over the next three weeks, please, put the arms down, let's not fight with the, the Guild, let's sit in a room and let's get a phasing model with shared risk, shared responsibility and options to make sure that we have a viable pharmacy sector. These are mum and dad businesses. These aren't big corporations. These are mum and dad businesses. And for us in the bush, these are, in many cases, our last line of primary care. Okay, so not, not necessarily government paying that dispensing fee, but giving pharmacists the ability to take on more other work, like prescribing medicines. I think there can be a mixture of both, Dave, and I think there's there's another pharmacy agreement that's due in the, in the government, the eighth pharmacy uh, agreement. That could be brought forward, sitting around the table, but working through and understanding there's opportunities uh, to share that risk, share that cost burden, but it's it's like childcare. We didn't ask childcare providers to pay for the $4.7 billion worth of subsidies, but oh. you're asking mum and dad businesses to have to bear that cost okay. just, uh, just, and at an arbitrary yeah. date of the 1st of September. Just before we move on, this will take effect now from... 1st of September. Parliament won't sit until after that. So um, just to clarify, will, will you seek to reverse this when Parliament's back and push medicine prices back up? 
if, if the government hasn't sat down and worked with the pharmacies around how they can actually work through this and, and phase this in a responsible way that protects the business model of pharmacists that actually made business decisions predicated on the model that we have here where prices mm -hmm. of medicines are regulated and that $8 was, was part of that business model, that they've made investment decisions. They've made employment decisions of, of people that they're employing today that. predicated but off that. You, you would, and they you have would put those medicine pay. prices so back up for... Um, I mean, what would you say to someone with diabetes or Parkinson's? You're willing to put their price back up. David, we, we would rather not have to have to go back to the parliament, but unfortunately the government hasn't sat down with the Guild in a constructive way in which they've tried to engage in. And we're saying to them, please, this is above politics. This is about the well-being the well-being of people, particularly in rural and remote Australia, that may have nothing. Right. And I get it might sound great to have a few dollars in your pocket living in Canberra and you can run from one suburb to the next to see a pharmacist. But just think in some of my towns that I represent, they could be four or 500 kilometres away from any primary care, uh, let alone uh, get cheaper medicine. Mm. So we're just saying, please, this is an opportunity for political leadership, for political courage and common sense. Let's uh, turn to um, renewable energy. I'm keen for your thoughts on the, the, the growing concern in the regions uh, amongst farmers in particular about the impact of transmission lines um, that are required for big wind and solar projects. Um, the government's acknowledged the need for better consultation. It's, it's uh, just commissioned a review into how um, communities are being consulted uh, about these transmission projects. Bottom line, though, if we're going to have all these renewables, we're going to need all of this transmission. So what's the solution here? Well, it's, it's to pause and to plan properly and to understand there's a place for renewables, uh, particularly if you want to look at solar. Um, if, you want to, if you want to put that into the concentration of population where it's required the most, then why wouldn't you put that on rooftops rather than on prime agricultural land or ripping down remnant vegetation? Uh, we're ripping down remnant vegetation not just for solar and for, for wind towers, but also the 28,000 kilometres of new transmission lines to plug all this in. Uh, and that is a reverse outcome where we're destroying the very thing that this policy is meant to protect. Even, even when we're looking at pumped hydros at Yungala outside Mackay or Barumba outside Gympie, uh, that's going to destroy remnant vegetation, pristine rainforest of platypus uh, just for a pumped hydro. So what's the answer? Knocking down I mean, the habitat of, of, if, 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 are you saying you're opposed well, to large scale renewable projects now, the, the big wind and solar farms? No, what I'm saying, David, is we've got the time to pause and to plan instead of this reckless race to 83% renewables by 2030. Uh, that has meant that basically everything's been thrown out the window, even EISs. Effectively, it's just slash and burn to get this in. Uh, so what we're saying is there's an opportunity to pause and to plan to get this right and to look at other alternatives because, you know, the only international commitment we have to meet is that of net zero by 2050. It's not by 2030 by what this government is taking us down. So we have the opportunity to, to look at the alternatives. And in fact, there are a number of professors out of Victoria University, Bruce Mountain uh, and, and Simon Bartlett, who actually believe there are opportunities where renewables and energy mix, along with carbon capture storage, and, and you even see today that the Biden administration is going to invest $1.2 billion into uh, investing into, into carbon capture storage. If we get back to first principles of reducing emissions, we can protect traditional industries, we can have well, renewables okay. as part but there, of that, there but there we can also look at the emerging zero emissions technology of small scale modular nuclear. All right, there are plenty of others though who say we do need to get cracking, uh, including our existing energy market operators. Um, when you say pause, are you saying we should pause on the net zero by 2050 target as well, or are you still, for the record, committed to that? Yeah, that's the policy of the National Party. The party, party room, National Party Party Room has made it clear that we made a commitment to net zero, but we made a commitment to get there by 2050, knowing that there was an arbitrary line of, of, of that achievement, that technology would solve much of this. And so what we're saying is not saying we have to pause for years or generations. It's about actually sitting down. One of the first thing I did when I became the leader of the Nationals was write to Anthony Albanese and say, let's have a National Energy Summit. Let's, as political leaders, 
come together with unions, with industry, with the energy sector itself, and let's plan this properly. Let's look at the emerging technology that we can cast our mind to, particularly here in this country, where we have sovereignty of all our resources, that we can look over the horizon and make sure we're making the right investments without the unintended consequences. So we're not saying, let's put this on pause forever. We're saying, let's just use some common sense. And I thought that it was an opportunity for political leadership, not just for me, but for, for Peter Dutton and for Anthony Albanese, to, to come forward and to look at solutions like emerging technology in net, in net zero small scale modular nuclear. And, and we didn't do it for the nine years we are in government because while the nationals have believed in this emerging technology, the liberals weren't. And it, it's taken the courage of Peter Dutton to come with us to have that conversation. And I, and I congratulate him for that. But why wouldn't we let the market decide, but let's educate Australians. This isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, this is something that we need to bring them on that journey. And that's why I wanted to have some political leadership from across the aisle and say, let's have a National Energy Summit. Let's uh, let Australians bring them into our trust and let them decide what our energy mix should look like while living up to our international commitments. Well, you and others, uh, you mentioned mentioned their nuclear power, you and others in the coalition have been uh, sounding a lot more keen on the idea of, of nuclear power and building them on old coal-fired uh, plants, um, in particular these small modular reactors. How many of those do you think Australia would need? Well, and I think this is where this National Energy Summit, sitting down and planning and making sure we get it right, will understand. I actually think that there's an opportunity for us to show that courage, but we don't have to spend a cent on it. We don't have to spend $2 billion like we're going to spend on hydrogen, which a couple of billionaires will get advantage of and, and walk away with. We can actually peek over the Pacific, see what happens, and we can adopt and adapt if we want. And this is where there needs to be proper planning, and this is where this reckless race to get to this target by 2030 is but, but, having the unintended... Yeah. Yeah, consequences also where need renewables to be, are losing their social licence. Uh, well, I also need to be clear about um, what nuclear would mean. These small modular reactors are defined as a reactor that can provide up to 300 megawatts. Uh, a a coal-fired yep. power plant can be 2,000 megawatts. Some estimates suggest you need 80 of these nuclear plants. Is that something you'd consider? No, David, I think this is where uh, where people like Chris Bowen are conflating. And, you know, most coal-fired power stations that are left now are around 1,200 megawatt. Now, if you're going to bring renewables in, and you do that in a sensible way in the right environment, and you plug these into where existing coal-fired power stations are, uh, then you also alleviate the need for the 28,000 kilometres of new transmission lines, which takes away a significant cost. So this is where you have the opportunity, and I think you'll see even before an SMR is put in, I think you'll see if we were, had the courage to open up. You'll see microgrids where industry themselves, like big smelters, can bring in even ones that are around three to five megawatt, and that allows them to actually um, bring down their costs and have a reliable energy source because the nuclear energy burns at a higher heat, greater efficiency, so it means it's a it's greater advantage for our manufacturing sector. But these are the conversations mm. we They're should be cheap, having though, now they? because this cheap. isn't going to happen. Well, nor's renewables, David, when you've got to plug in 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines and you're destroying natural yeah. habitat to plug them all in. So let's have, let's have a, a, an honest conversation. Even the Gen Cost report that Chris Bowen was brandishing around fails to acknowledge the 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines. This is why we should take the politics out of this, have a National Energy Summit, bring the experts in, and I may be proved wrong. But I've got the courage of my conviction to stand forward as a political leader in this courage, country and say, let's actually try and work this out together so that we can, we can move forward together right. with what we should have is reliable, cheap energy that's reducing our emissions. A couple of other things on the voice to parliament. Uh, David Littleproud, what's wrong with listening to Indigenous Australians when designing laws that affect them? Well, nothing, David, but it's the mechanism that's been put in place. This isn't something new that um, uh, the Prime Minister's put in place in The Voice. He's saying this is something brand new. This isn't. We've done this before. We had a representative body before. It was called ATSIC. So what, what's and wrong with... Well, you, it's a little bit different. ATSIC had the power to actually allocate funding and run programs. This, this is an advisory body. It, no, it, it, again, David, the problem comes from the lived experience we have, and it might work in, in suburbs, in, in capital cities, but when you're talking about representative bodies in rural and remote Australia, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of square kilometres, hundreds of different diverse communities that have different challenges and different needs. Mm. So what's and wrong with listening to them? What's, what's happened, wrong with listening to them? 
Well, nothing, David, and that's why I'm saying there needs to be a 2023 intervention. That intervention needs to be with the bureaucracy. We don't need a bigger bureaucracy, we need a better one. Where we know, to the, to the postcode, the disadvantage and where the gap hasn't closed. So this isn't about generalising and bringing representatives to Canberra and saying this is what it is, and then the bureaucrats generalise a national program that has no buy-in by a local community. What works is empowering local elders in local communities, because invariably they're the that, ones that isn't that what's that being talked about? Community. here, listening to those local voices through a national no, but, voice. No, so, but sadly, David, what we've got is you're going to have 24 representatives, two from each state, and then you'll have regional representatives that will be covering hundreds of thousands of square kilometres mm. that, that, with hundreds of different diverse communities. And this is the mistake we made last time with a representative body. This is about making sure that we do things differently, not repeat the mistakes well, of the past, despite just, what the Prime Minister saying. This is a, this is the same it's thing for us in rural this and is, This is an advisory body, not, no, like, not like ATSIC. Just, just finally, with the Nationals' David, support and where the money's getting spent. Oh, with the national support legislating a voice? Well, that's something that, that my party room would have to work through in the details. You don't have but a view on obviously that? Obviously, we've got great concern. Well, personally, I have a real concern about going back to regional models because what it means to us in regional remote areas is hundreds of thousands of square kilometres, right. not 20 square kilometres across a couple of suburbs. So you're this at odds with Peter Dutton on that. You, you, you don't support legislating a voice. Well, that's okay. I, I, I'm, the, I'm in the National Party, if, and if the National Party doesn't get comfort with that, that's what we stand for. But so under the coalition, should you win view, the election, we, we may not get any sort of legislated voice. Well, there'll be a change in how we're doing things at the moment, David, but that's something that my party room, and it's not my decision to make in isolation, mm -hmm. that's the primacy of my party room, and we'll work through it from the lived experience that we have okay. from representing rural and remote Australia and making sure that we get their interests uh, heard in, in what that policy setting will look right. like. But we'll be constructive in any negotiations with anybody. Just a final one on a more positive note, uh, David Little Proud. Should the Matildas make it all the way to the World Cup and win the final... Uh, will you support the Prime Minister's call for a national public holiday? Yeah, my great night. No, I'm still... Uh, I didn't get much sleep. I, my blood pressure didn't come down to let me go to sleep. But, uh, look, I don't want to be Captain Killjoy on this, but, look, I, I think business has a, has a point here. Uh, it's easy to call for a national holiday when, holiday when someone else is paying for it. Uh, I'm proud of the, the Matildas, and I think every Australian is, and we're going to be riding at home every, on Wednesday but a, but night. But no to the, the public next, holiday. Uh, Sunday night. I think we've just got to understand that someone's got to foot that bill and, and businesses out there are doing it tough. Uh, we're, we live in a great nation. We can celebrate our wins, but we've got to get on and pay the bills and, and make sure that uh, the, the country keeps going. All right, David Littleproud, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, mate.